Hello and welcome to Ancient History Encyclopedia. My name is Kelly and today we're going to be having a look at the 4th century BCE, Alexander the Great and the beginning of Hellenization. The 4th century BCE was a period of significant change in many geographic regions and among these was the development of Western philosophy in Greece, the fall of the Achaemenid Empire in Persia and the life of Alexander the Great of Macedon. Up until the 4th century BCE, no one was able to control all of Greece. That is, until Philip II of Macedon came along and conquered the region in 338 BCE. Now, he was only able to conquer the region because of all of the small wars that the Greek city-states were fighting against each other. And this saw Athens, Thebes and Sparta all vying for supremacy, which exhausted their strength and made them much easier to conquer. After Philip II died in 336 BCE, his son Alexander the Great inherited the Macedonian Empire and had even bigger plans for its expansion. Alexander was successful in invading Persia without making any alliances, which meant that there was no one to betray him or warn Darius, so he could take the Achaemenids by surprise. In 334 BCE, Alexander moved quickly and unexpectedly advanced into Darius III's realm, which was the Achaemenid Empire, along with 32,000 men which was an advantage because Darius and the Persians weren't aware of Alexander's movements, so they could not stop him from crossing the Hellespont. Alexander's success against the Persians has been credited to his ability to outthink his opponents, his decisive action under pressure, and his ferocity whilst fighting with his men on the front line, which won him their complete loyalty. His success in battle could not have occurred without the Macedonian phalanx and the Pes de Tyroi, or foot companions. They were armed with a long spear, known as the Sarissa, which had a flexible shaft and could be anchored to the ground to stop a charging cavalry, since it wouldn't break like a regular spear. The Sarissa wasn't only effective against cavalry, but was helpful whilst charging opposing infantry. Since it was longer than the Persian javelin, it could break the lines of soldiers. In 333 BCE, Alexander led his army in the Battle of Issus, which began quite badly for the Macedonians. Darius planned on meeting Alexander in battle in the Syrian plains, so that he could surround the outnumbered Macedonian army. However, Alexander did not meet Darius in battle immediately and drew him towards the Pinarus River away from his wide open space. They ended up fighting at the Pinarus River, with Alexander beginning by charging the left wing of the Persians with his heavy cavalry and after making a great impact, weakened the Persians. After overcoming the left wing, Alexander and the Macedonian phalanx turned and attacked the center of the Persians. The two armies clashed in close combat in the river, and Darius, who narrowly avoided being killed by Alexander's spear, turned and fled and left his wife, mother and children behind. And it was the historian Arian who wrote, It was at once evident to Alexander's men that Darius had become cowed in spirit, but when the armies at length met in conflict, Alexander rode about in every direction to exhort his troops to show their valour. And a letter sent by Alexander to Darius read, Let any communication you wish to make with me be addressed to the king of all Asia. Do not write to me as an equal. Alexander then campaigned against the powerful city of Tyre, who refused to submit, and it took seven months for Alexander to take the city, and many people of Tyre were killed or sold as slaves. He then marched to Egypt and declared himself Pharaoh, which Darius I had done not that long before. Throughout 330 BCE, whilst Alexander the Great was conquering the Achaemenid Empire, it was as if a game of cat and mouse was being played, with Darius fleeing and Alexander pursuing him. Because of Darius's failure to defeat Alexander, he was stabbed by his own men, including his cousin Bessus, who, after killing Darius, proclaimed himself King of Persia. That did not last long, because Alexander took Persia and then put an end to Bessus's rule. 
He went as far east as India, where he was stopped by Chandragupta Maurya and his war elephants. Alexander created the largest empire the world had seen to date, and spread Greek culture and language all throughout the Near East and Asia, a process known as Hellenizing. Alexander died without having fully realized his vision of a vast empire united under his rule. However, he was not soon forgotten, not only because of his conquests, but due to the many cities which he renamed, founded, and repopulated after himself. According to Plutarch, there were around 70 cities named Alexandria, or something derived from it. The most famous was Alexandria in Egypt, which became the seat of power of the Ptolemaic Kingdom. After Alexander died, Egypt was taken by one of his generals, Ptolemy, who founded the Ptolemaic dynasty in 323 BCE. Shortly after, the Seleucid Empire was founded in Mesopotamia in 312 BCE by one of Alexander's generals, Seleucus I Nicator. Both Seleucus and Ptolemy continued the process of Hellenization throughout the Near East, which was begun by Alexander. In the 4th century, Western philosophy developed through the efforts of the philosophers Socrates, Plato and Aristotle, who lay the foundation for modern philosophy, religion, political thought, scientific and intellectual discourse. Aristotle was young Alexander's tutor, and through Alexander's conquests and Hellenization, these ideas spread around the world. Hellenization laid the foundation of the development of the modern age by introducing a common culture and language throughout the ancient world during the 4th century BCE. It also enabled greater cross-cultural transmission and advances in technology, religion, and other aspects of civilization. At the same time, Hellenization disrupted the progress of the cultures it unified by introducing and elevating Greek customs and language at the expense of the indigenous cultural values. So, do you think Hellenization was a good thing? And do we still see this concept today? Let us know down in the comments below. This video was brought to you by Ancient History Encyclopedia. For more great articles and interactive content, head to our website via the link below. Ancient History Encyclopedia is a not-for-profit organization. If you'd like to support our work, hit the support button on the screen or via the link below. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to leave it a thumbs up, pop a comment down below and subscribe for more. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you soon.